Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to Trumpet's Call. I'm Amaria. I pray that you are holding on to faith, Amuna, and holding on to hope during these times. Thank you for joining me once again on the channel and for another teaching. We do things in the world, and we're not always aware why we do what we do, why we think what we think, and sometimes why we feel how we feel. We are being influenced by years and generations of culture that's not ours. When we were brought over to the United States and to Europe and all parts of the world, we inherited parts of their culture. And we began to believe certain things that they believed in their culture that influenced us. Sometimes for good, I should say, rarely for good, but most often for evil. So we're going to be talking about a few of those things today, and we're going to be delving into the topic of superstition as it relates to the practice of witchcraft. Is it possible that we are engaging in the practice of witchcraft without knowing it? It's very possible. And so the reason for bringing these things out is so that we can cease and desist, we can repent and halt and change our way so that we can be pleasing to the Most High in all ways, at all times, and in all things. So we're going to get started today. We're going to be addressing, first of all, the science of superstition and why people believe in the unbelievable. So we're going to be looking into this little article for just a bit as we get started for today. So this article begins... The number 13, black cats, breaking mirrors, walking under ladders, may all be things you actively avoid. If you're anything like 25% of the people in the United States who consider themselves superstitious. Even if you don't consider yourself a particularly superstitious person, you probably say, bless you, when someone sneezes, just in case the devil should decide to steal their soul. As our ancestors thought possible during a sneeze. Did you all know that that's why people say bless you? Because the superstitious belief was that if you didn't, the devil might steal the person's soul. Do you say bless you? Did you know why you say it? Let's continue. Superstition also explains why many buildings do not have a 13th floor, preferring to label it as 14 or 14A or 12B or M. The 13th letter of the alphabet on elevator button panels because of concerns about superstitious tenants. Indeed, 13% of the people in one survey indicated that staying on the 13th floor of a hotel would bother them, and 9% said that they would ask for a different room. So what is superstition? What is it exactly? Although there is no single definition of superstition, it generally means a belief in supernatural forces such as fate, the desire to influence unpredictable factors, and a need to resolve uncertainty. In this way, then, individual beliefs and experiences drive superstitions, which explains why they are generally irrational and often defy current scientific wisdom. So the idea behind a superstition, then, is that which comes from the unseen realm, it's a belief that something that we do can either harm us or bring us good fortune, and that we need to control our world and control our own fate through our actions. Now, if you think about controlling your fate, so to speak, through your actions, and you relate that to, for example, keeping the Most High's commandments, if I keep the Most High's commandments, I will be baruched, I will be saved. I will inherit eternal life. If I believe in Yahusha, if I do what I'm told to do, if I'm pleasing to the Most High, I will inherit life. This is not superstitious. It's fact, right? But if you believe that saying bless you after someone sneezes will keep that person from being taken over by the devil, that is something that is based on your own belief system of something that you must do in order to save yourself or that person. So, at its core, superstition defies the Most High Yahuwah because it takes one's fate into the person's own hands. 
It's saying you must do this in order to save yourself, in order to bless yourself, in order to keep yourself from being attacked. So that's, first of all, the problem with superstition. Secondly, the problem with superstition is that oftentimes they're not true, right? I can't think of a superstition that's true. And if it is true, it's not a superstition. Some people may call things superstitious when they're really not. But just because someone calls it doesn't mean it's so. So there's a lot that we have to sort out between what is real and what is not. So who gets to determine? Well, the Most High Yahuwah does. We take our word from him. He tells us what is truth and what is error. And so if we believe him, we read his word, we're guided by the Ruach HaKadosh within, we won't find ourselves sinking into superstitious behavior. But I will tell you, brothers and sisters, that there are many of us who have been doing things and thinking things and feeling certain ways for a long time, and we had no idea that the things that we were doing, thinking, feeling, believing, were steeped in superstition. And superstition is closely aligned with witchcraft because the idea behind witchcraft is crafting your own fate, separate and apart from the Most High Yahuwah. Okay, we're going to talk more about witchcraft in just a bit. But now we're going to take a look at this article entitled 60 Common Superstitions That People Around the World Believe. These bizarre rituals might bring peace of mind to some people, but not to me. This is by Jessica Jing. Now, I'm not going to read all 60, obviously. I'm just going to touch on a few of these. Well, more than a few, probably about half of them or so and then offer just a brief commentary when I feel led to do so. And then we're going to get through this list, just touching on a few of the main highlights on this list. But you may be surprised to find things that you grew up believing, your mama told you, your daddy told you, maybe your granny told you, and you thought, oh, I thought they were just speaking wisdom to me. I didn't know that it was just a superstition. So let's get started with this list. Here are 60 common superstitions around the world that people believe. Number one, never place two mirrors opposite one another. And it says here, to me, there's nothing creepier than a mirror or your own reflection for that matter. According to Joshua Partlow, Washington Post Mexican bureau chief, putting two in front of each other opens a threshold for the devil. I have heard that it opens a portal into darkness. Now, whether that's true or not, whether it opens a portal into another dimension, into a demonic realm or not, I don't know. I have heard that. I have. But I don't know if that's true. So is it superstitious or is it truth? The only way we're going to know is if Abba tells us whether or not it's true or not. As I said before, there are some things that are believed to be superstition that are actually fact. And who determines? The Most High does. So if this is truth, the Most High will reveal it to us and tell us if it is so. But for right now, it's number one on this list of common superstitions. Number two, never shake hands or kiss across a threshold. In Moscow, if you kiss or shake hands with someone across a doorway, across two different rooms, then your lover or friend will become your mortal enemy. Okay, that's what they believe. Certainly a superstition. Another Never allow the broom to touch the feet of anyone you know. In Afghanistan, according to Tarakan from Bethesda, Maryland, if you sweep the floor and your broom touches the feet of a loved one, one of your parents will die. Now, I believe this is a superstition for sure, but I do remember growing up, and if you were sweeping, you did not dare sweep someone's foot with the broom, that they considered that very bad. They never said what would happen if you did it, but I remember getting close to people's feet, like my mom's foot, you know, sweeping, and she would indicate that that was not a good thing to do. Never quite got on the understanding why. So let's continue. Number six, whistling indoors invites evil. In Lithuania, it is forbidden to whistle indoors because the noise is believed to summon demons. Lies, <laughs> not true, but this is what they believe in Lithuania. Perhaps you've heard that as well. Perhaps you believe that. It's a superstition. Number seven, don't cheers with water. Sometimes when you're 
the designated driver, it is necessary to cheers with a cup of free tap water. But in Germany, if you cheer with water, you are actually wishing death upon the people you're drinking with. Once again, lies. It's based in superstitious fear, not in fact. But this is what some people believe. Here's another. Keep your shoes off the table. Not only is it gross, but in Britain, it is considered bad luck because it symbolizes the death of a loved one. I can't see how that would symbolize the death of a loved one, but it is gross. You should not put your shoes on the table. It's not a good idea, but not because you're afraid that your loved one's going to die. The most high numbers are days, and he determines our yesterdays and our tomorrows, and we live or die by his command, not by someone putting shoes on the table. Number nine. An itchy hand might be telling of your financial future. In Turkey, an itchy right hand means you will come into some money, while an itchy left hand means you will lose out big time. Wow. Growing up, it didn't matter which hand. I have heard it I don't know how many times. If either one of your hands itch, that means you're going to get money. This is something that was really big and really believed, and many people still believe this to this day. Do you? Are you one of the people who believes that if your hands itch, you're going to get money? It's a superstition. The Most High didn't tell you you were going to get money, so you should not believe such things as an itchy palm. Maybe your hands are itching because you need some lotion. And so we assign meaning to things based on fear or based on a desire to gain something. And so these superstitions have come into our lives and we just believe them because our mamas did grandmamas did, our great grandmamas did, and so we just said, well, it must be true, right? No, not necessarily so. Skipping to number 18. Don't enter a room with your left foot. In Spain, walking into a room with your left foot will bring bad luck. Instead, lead with your right. Now, who can tell? When you're walking, you're walking. How do you know? How are you so cognizant of which foot you're leading as you walk into a room? This is nonsensical. Just walk. Enter into a room carefully. Don't hurt anybody. Don't bump into anything, right? Don't allow half-truths and half-baked ideas to dictate your future. Enter into a room with love and with peace. Hallelujah. Number 19. Don't open umbrellas inside. I've heard this many, 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 many times. A fairly universal superstition. It is bad luck to open an umbrella before you head outside because bad luck will rain on you. This is what it said. This came from the British in the 18th century when waterproof umbrellas were told to cause injury if opened inside the home. Well, it may not be a good idea to open an umbrella inside if you're going to poke somebody with it or hurt someone with it. But superstitious because it's going to harm you in some way or bring bad luck? No. Mm -mm. The Most High determines, once again, what happens to us. And it's based on our level of obedience, not whether or not we open an umbrella inside the house. Number 20. Hide your thumbs when passing a graveyard. I admit I have never heard of this one. In Japan, it's common practice to tuck your thumbs in when passing by graveyards to protect your parents. This is because the Japanese word for thumb loosely translates to parent finger. So hiding it protects them from death. No, it doesn't. But I can see that if people think so, they would feel a need to do this. This is not based in fact. It's based in fear. And many superstitions are indeed based in fear and not in fact. Number 21. Knock on wood for good luck. I've seen people do this as well. We usually say knock on wood to ward off bad luck, but this very popular saying is said to have originated in Europe. Many churches claim to have pieces of Jesus' cross, so knocking on wood is said to bring good luck. Hmm, interesting. Not so. I don't see how they would have pieces of the tree that Yahushua was hung from, and knocking on it would not bring you any good luck. Bowing before our Father... In Yahushua's name and repenting for sins, that would bring you life. Hallelujah. We don't believe in good luck or bad luck. We just believe in blessings and cursings that comes from obedience versus disobedience. Number 22. Don't chew gum at night. 
When you chew gum at night, according to a Turkish legend, it turns into the flesh of the dead. Oh my word, oh my word. Where do people get these things? Oh my goodness. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. This is superstitious. This is a lie. But people live their lives based on these fears. And it's so unfortunate. Hallelujah. Don't believe it. Don't live your life in fear. Number 28. Throw salt over your shoulder if you spill it. I've seen people do this. If you have butter fingers, don't fret. While it may seem it would cause a bigger mess, throw the spilled salt over your shoulder to get some good fortune on your side. Don't do that. I've seen people do this in movies, and I never really understood why they did it, but apparently this is why. So another superstition, another lie. Don't do it. Number 29. Give a penny if you receive something sharp. Never heard of this one either. Don't give something sharp to someone you are trying to start a relationship with. But if you do receive a knife set or scissors as a present, give the gift giver a coin as a present in return. Okay. Never heard of this. Um, just don't run with scissors. That's what I would say. Don't run with knives. Don't run with scissors. And also don't believe superstitions. Number 30. Don't sleep with your head facing north. According to Japanese superstition, sleeping with your head in this position is bad luck. Also, number 31, avoid sleeping with your head to the west. In Africa, the same superstition exists if you sleep with your head facing west. So I'm sure in some other part of the world, there's a superstition for allowing your head to face south, north, east, or west. So how then should you sleep? Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the superstition. Skipping to number 36. Knitting outside can bring long winters. My word. If you're in Ireland, keep the knitting inside unless you like the cold weather. There's a superstition that doing your needlework on your front porch will keep the temperature freezing. I don't even understand how people can come up with this one. So if you knit outside, it controls the weather? Hmm. Unbelievable. Number 37. Don't play with yo-yos. Syria banned yo-yos because they're believed to cause droughts. A yo-yo. A yo-yo caused a drought. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Number 38. Don't get a haircut on a Tuesday. Getting a haircut on Tuesdays in India will cause bad luck. My word. Oh, Father, help us. Help us, Abba. No, it, it won't. It, it won't. So don't believe that. Right? Don't believe lies because the belief of a lie can affect you negatively. And perhaps people came up with these superstitions and began to abide by them and found themselves thinking they were true because they believed so much that if they did such thing or that thing, that they would have good fortune or bad fortune, that it became a self fulfilling prophecy for them. Number 39. Pregnant women should give in to their cravings. There's a Canadian superstition that expectant mothers who crave fish but don't eat it will end up having a baby with a fish head. So make sure not to deny your body what it wants. A fish head. Not eating fish causes your baby to have a fish head? Nope, not true, but some people believe it. Number 42, go to the hospital on Wednesdays. Apparently going to the hospital on Wednesdays is a good thing to do. Well, in today's current culture, going to the hospital on any day can be sketchy. But if you go to the hospital, no matter what day of the week it is, take Abba with you, right? Go in the Ruach and go as he leads and he will be with you and protect you. Number 43, don't wear red during a storm. In the Philippines, people believe that red attracts lightning. So if you don't want a nasty surprise on a rainy day, make sure to stay away from this bold shade. Okay, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say I definitively know, but I don't think that lightning is attracted to a particular color. So wear your red freely, right? Wear your red and trust in the Most High. Number 44, a horseshoe is good luck. I've heard this, don't believe it. Number 45, black cats are bad luck. Heard it, don't believe it. I don't like black cats though. I'm not crazy about cats just in general, 
but I don't particularly like black cats. They look kind of spooky. Maybe it's because of all those Hollywood movies that they put them in to be spooky characters. I'm not sure why, but bad luck, what brings bad fortune is sin. Sin. Hallelujah. Number 47, don't sneeze once, just once. In India, it's bad luck to sneeze only once. Now, who can control that? How can you make yourself sneeze more than once? And number 48, bad things happen in threes. Now, I can't tell you how many of our people say this all the time. And all they're doing is they're calling down curses upon themselves. Hear me well, family. How many of you have said that? I've heard it so many times. Did the Most High tell us that? Did Abba say bad things happen in threes? He didn't say that. Why are you believing it? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahuwah. Yahuwah didn't say bad things happen in threes. So don't believe lies. Don't believe. Number 49. Don't comment on a particularly cute baby. In Thailand, you shouldn't comment on a person's cute baby as many families believe it will take the beauty away. Really? You say a baby's cute and then all of a sudden the beauty vanishes just because you brought it up? No. Um, no. Just no. Number 54. Don't kiss babies on the lips. If you do, you will curse your baby to a lifetime of drooling. Oh my word. Oh, Father, help us. Oh, Father, help us. I know that there are many of us who have kissed our babies on the lips, and they are adults, and they don't drool. All praises to the Most High Yahuwah. Number 55. Keep your bananas off a cruise ship. Oh, Father, help us. Help us. Fishermen don't bring bananas on boats, as it brings bad luck out on the open seas. A banana? No, just no. Number 56, carry an acorn to gain immortality. Just no, no, no. Believe in Yahuwah to send you salvation through Yahusha. That's how you gain eternal life, not through acorns. So I don't recommend keeping an acorn in your pocket, as this article says, so that you can ensure a life of forever youthful complexion. That's a lie. There's only one way to eternal life, and it's through Yahusha. Hallelujah. Abba has sent us this one way to get to himself. And finally, number 57. Don't let your purse touch the ground. Oh, if I've heard this once, I've heard it a hundred times. Don't let your purse touch the ground. It means all the money will fly. This is what I heard. If you let your purse touch the ground, all the money will fly out of the purse. And you won't have good fortune. You won't have money. You won't be able to keep money in your in your life, in your purse, if you put it on the floor. This is how what I heard growing up. Now, if you want to avoid putting your purse on the floor because you don't want to get it dirty, because it's a nice purse, that's common sense, right? But don't fear. The Most High provides for us. He is our provision. He is our source. We don't have to fear. We're not in control of our fate and our fortune. Ab Yahuwah is. So it says, in Brazil, people believe that if you put your purse on the ground, you will become penniless. Better work out those arms because you can't let that tote rest on the floor for even a second. Yep. As I said, I have heard this so many times and I don't believe it. The Most High provides for his children and he provides our baraka based on our obedience. Obedience. Hallelujah. So these are just some of the superstitions that were listed in this article. If you have to read more because you're very curious, I don't recommend it, but if you have to, the link to this article is listed at the bottom of this page. So we're going to talk now a little bit about witchcraft and how these superstitions are related to witchcraft. Ultimately, the desire to control one's fate, one's fortune, the desire to control one's life separate and apart from the Most High Yahuwah is at the heart of witchcraft, at the heart of witchcraft. So let's talk about this. What is witchcraft? Well, it is defined as magic or sorcery. 
It's also defined as Wicca. Okay. A magical or irresistible influence, attraction, or charm. So witchcraft is defined as something that it seems or feels irresistible. It's an influence. It's an attraction. It's a charm. It's something that draws you in. Okay. And before you know it, you're involved in things that you shouldn't be. It is also the use of sorcery or magic. It is communication with the devil or with a familiar spirit. This is all under the heading of witchcraft, okay? I really want us to hone in on just a little bit this idea of a magical influence. Someone can bring you under their quote-unquote spell, their charms. Maybe they're a nice person. Maybe they compliment you all the time. Maybe you're being bewitched. But we're going to get into that in just a bit. It's also defined as an irresistible influence or fascination. Perhaps someone's got an irresistible fascination on you or with you. And perhaps you have an irresistible desire to be influenced by them. Number three, it also includes rituals and practices that incorporate a belief in magic and that are associated especially with neo-pagan traditions and religions such as, once again, Wicca, or less commonly, witchcraft. It is also a tradition or religion that involves the practice of witchcraft, okay? So what is a witch then? Because we understand that the practice is called witchcraft, and this word is a compound word. So it's comprised of the word witch and craft. So we're going to look up witch and craft and see if we can gain a better understanding of just what this is. So witch means it is from the old English word wiki, the masculine warlock, and from warloga is of a different etymology. It is a term rooted in European folklore and superstition. Once again, here's that word again, superstition. Superstition is tied to witchcraft. For a practitioner of witchcraft, magic or sorcery, you could have somebody who's a witch tell you that you need to throw salt over your shoulder in order to have good luck. So this is where these things come from. Many of these superstitions come from these people who practice witchcraft, telling people how to have good fortune, separate and apart from obeying the Most High Yahuwah. And when you engage in these actions, these superstitious beliefs, you are partaking in witchcraft unknowingly. A witch is also defined as a person who serves as a medium for evil by the use of magic. To bewitch or to deceptively bring someone under one's control in thought, words, or in deeds. It is to cause someone to do your bidding and to do what you want them to do. The Father causes us to obey him through his love and his perfection. But the wicked one uses manipulation, control, trickery, lies, all manner of things. And this is at the heart of superstition, at the heart of witchcraft. And this is why, among other reasons, we must avoid it. Craft. The word craft is defined as developing proficiency in a skill or a trade. Okay. So if you have a job, that is your craft. And to have craft is to be proficient at whatever you do for a job. It is also, though, to be skilled in evasion, deception, or guile, or some manner of secret power. A craft is also defined, I don't have it written on the screen here, but a craft is also defined as a group of people who do said things, right? So if you had a group of people who practiced sorcery, they could call themselves a craft as they practice and engage in their craft. Sorcery. We have seen the word sorcery a couple of times now, so let's look up this word sorcery. Sorcery is defined as the use of supernatural power over others through the assistance of spirits. Another word, witchcraft. So sorcery is a synonym for witchcraft. Divination by the assistance or supposed assistance of evil spirits or the power of commanding evil spirits. Magic, necromancy, witchcraft, enchantment. Okay, so all of these things are but synonyms for the overall idea of witchcraft. Necromancy is the worship of the dead or the 
interaction between those who were living and those who were dead. And sometimes people consult the dead for answers to questions. Maybe they believe that they watch over them. They keep watch over them, as I discussed in another video recently. Do the dead communicate or watch over the living? No, they don't. Because according to scripture, the dead are asleep. So if you're interacting with someone who was dead and passed on, that is likely not your dead relative. Continuing on, divination. The scripture refers to witchcraft as divination. The Hebrew word for divination is kasam. So according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, divination is the art or practice that seeks to foresee or foretell future events or discover hidden knowledge, usually by the interpretation of omens or by the aid of supernatural powers. It is also the act of finding out and saying what will happen in the future from a divine being, either from the Most High, because he has told you you are his prophet or you operate in the prophetic and he has indicated things to you that's going to happen, that is legitimate, or from the mighty fallen ones or demon spirit, that is not legitimate. We are not called to do that, okay? So, kasam is divination. Divination is witchcraft. They're the same thing. This is how the scripture defines it. So let's continue on. So the term divination originates from Latin, from the Latin word divinere, which means to foresee, to foretell, to predict, or to prophesy. It is related to the word divinis, which means divine, or to be inspired by a G-O-D. Divination is the effort to obtain insight into a question or situation by way of an occultic, standardized process or a ritual. A ritual. Superstitious behavior is ritualistic. So engaging in behaviors repeatedly over and over and over again, walking into the room in a certain way, making sure you throw salt over your shoulder, making sure you knock on wood, or making sure that you don't open umbrellas in the house. These are ritualistic behaviors designed to bring forth a particular outcome. It is witchcraft. It's what it is. And we are to cease and desist all semblance of witchcraft in our lives. We are to trust in the Most High. Continuing. To engage in divination is to reveal mysterious knowledge by supernatural practices. It is correlated with the occult and involves fortune-telling or soothsaying, as it used to be called. Now, the whole idea of soothsaying is soothsaying, just like the idea of prophecy or divination, has a positive aspect. To divine what the Most High is saying is positive. To divine what the wicked one is saying or dead relatives or demonic spirits posing as your dead relatives is wicked. Okay? Soothsaying used to be called truth saying or truth telling, right? The word sooth in Old English means truth. So it used to be associated with speaking the truth from a source that is legitimate. And if you're wicked, you could also think that you're telling the truth if you're seeking wisdom or knowledge from a source that's not the most high. It all depends on your perspective. So the word used to have a more positive connotation, even though it may have been just as wicked as it's believed to be now. So let's talk about soothsaying. The word soothsayer. In Hebrew, the word for soothsayer is nakash, which means to hiss a hissing serpent. It is to speak occult knowledge by the influence or by influence from the wicked one, directly or indirectly by the influence of committing sin. It is also someone who predicts the future by magical, intuitive, or more rational means. So the word soothsayer is related to sorcery, it's related to witchcraft, it's related to divination same kinds of things. It is seeking hidden knowledge or seeking an advantage somehow in your waking natural life through seeking information from another source that's not earthly. So we're going to look at this word nakash. As I stated before, the word for divination is the word nakash, 
So you can see it there is strong 5173. It's the word Nakash. That means divination, enchantment. Uh, divination, enchantment, omens. Okay. And this word has a root word. The root word is 5172, Nakash. And it is to practice divination or to observe signs. Okay. To practice divination, observe signs. So if we observe the signs that the Most High tells us to observe, we are divining. We are divining rightly. The Father told us to watch and pray. Watch for signs and to pray. Okay, pray to Him. Look to Him for answers. This is right and correct. To look to any other source for answers other than the Most High is wickedness. It is sorcery. It is witchcraft. Now, with that said, it doesn't mean that if you're listening to someone prophesy in Yahushua's name, directly from the Father, that that is wicked. It is not. It is how the Father communicates with us, right? Through his Son, through the prophet. Or he could communicate directly with you. But if you are looking to another spiritual source, magic, darkness, white magic, black magic, that is not of the Most High. It's not. We also see the word Nakash, once again in the scriptures, in Strong's 5175, and this word means serpent. Yes, serpent. Okay, so this word nakash is related to divination or deception, but there's also a link to the serpent, the wicked one. Okay, so when we divine rightly, when we hear from the Most High and allow Him to, to communicate through His Ruach, this is right. But another potential way to divine is to divine through wicked means, through the serpent. So this is what happened to Eve. Eve was influenced negatively by the serpent's hiss, who brought her into deception and error as she allowed herself to be influenced wickedly by this hiss in her ear. So now we're going to talk about how, in addition to superstitions, we practice witchcraft or divination without realizing it. Number one, giving gifts. Giving gifts, that is, with strings attached. Many of us have done it. Many of us do it still. Have you ever given someone something and your goal is to see the reaction so that you can glory in that? So that you can boast in their reaction? So that it could feed you somehow? I'm not talking about the joy that comes from giving a gift. I'm talking about the sense of delight, the sense of I feel really good about myself because they like the gift. That is not of the Most High. To have joy in giving is wonderful, but if you can't be there to watch the person open the gift and they never send you a thank you note, are you still going to be okay with giving? If you're not, you're doing it for the wrong reasons and you're doing it with strings attached. And the strings that you have attached to your gift are demonic because you are in the process of engaging in witchcraft. You are trying to control how someone feels about you or thinks about you based on your giving the gift. When you give the gift, you give it, you wash your hands, you don't think about it anymore. You don't attach a string to it that tethers you to that person so that that person can think good things about you. It's over, right? The gift is given, don't think about it anymore. If the person reaches out to you to say thank you, receive the thank yous and go on about your business, okay? So when we give gifts, it should be because we desire to please the Most High. If you are a person who feels unloved and it makes you feel good to give to other people, you really have to check yourself. You really have to examine your heart. Am I trying to get something from someone by giving them this gift? Is my motive pure? Am I being led by the Ruach? Or am I trying to feed that feeling of deficiency that I have in my soul? This feeling of not measuring up? This feeling of not being enough? Am I giving with strings attached? Am I holding people accountable to my expectations because I gave them a gift and they didn't say thank you? Or they didn't say, well, you really were nice for doing that. 
or they didn't keep coming back mentioning it over and over and over again. This is a form of control over others. And at the heart of it, with regard to interpersonal relationships, the way we engage with someone, if we seek to control, it's witchcraft. So we have to be very careful in this. We have to check our motives when we're giving to others. We have to. If you find yourself being willing to bend over backwards to give your shirt off your back for somebody, it's a wonderful thing. But what's motivating you? Is it the Ruach HaKadosh? Or is it a desire to be loved and accepted? If you are giving to others because you desire to be loved in return from them, it's manipulation, it's control, it's witchcraft. Ask the Most High to give you pure motives so that you can give with no strings attached. So the gift then, it could be a physical gift, it could be a compliment. Speaking of compliments, do you compliment people because you want them to like you? Because you want them to feel good about themselves and then they'll like you? You gave them a gift of a compliment, but it had strings attached. This is not what we're to do. This is having guile in our mouths. This is engaging in trickery. And sometimes we do it without even knowing it. We've got to be very careful about how we operate in the world. And we can't do anything that's designed to bring people under our control, to get them to think a certain way about us because of how we interact with them. We really have to check ourselves and let our yay be yay and our nay be nay. And in the process of allowing our yay to be yay and our nay to be nay, we examine ourselves before the Most High in sincerity and in truth. We ask ourselves, are you a people pleaser? Are you engaging in people pleasing in your actions or are your actions genuinely designed to help and to serve? We have to ask, we have to, because if we're serving for the wrong purpose, then there's no reward. There's none, there's no reward. You already have it. The people's pleasure, them liking you, them liking your gifts, them liking the things that you do, that's your reward. There is no further reward from the Most High in His sight. So I really encourage each of us to ask ourselves the question, am I posting what I post? Am I doing what I do? Am I giving what I give? Am I sharing what I share? Am I complimenting the way I'm complimenting? Am I doing these things? because my heart is genuinely motivating me or am I looking to receive something from someone in return? Am I fishing for a compliment? Am I fishing for praise? Am I fishing for acceptance? We have to ask. Because if we do these things for the Father's pleasure, there's great reward, great reward. But if we do them for any other motive, any other selfish motive where we're looking to gain something in return, there is no reward for us. Before we continue on, I'm going to ask you one more question. If you have ever worn something, written something, posted something, liked something, given someone a compliment, given someone a gift, gone somewhere, done something for someone, or any of these things, volunteered to stay late at work, what have you, if you've done any of these things with a thought in mind, if I do this action, such and such will like it, this person will see me, this person will think I'm nice, you're not going to get rewarded by the Father. But if you do it from the motive of, if I do these things, Abba will be pleased, that's the right motivation. So if we're not there yet, many of us aren't, honestly speaking, we're not all there. But the Father is granting us this message to help us to get there. So now we know the right questions to ask. Now we know to ask ourselves, am I people pleasing or am I Yahuwah pleasing? Right? And so we can stop and ask ourselves so that we can get back onto the right trajectory if we find ourselves doing things for the praise of man and not for the praise of Ab Yahuwah. Number two, the second way that we oftentimes engage in witchcraft unknowingly is by becoming angry at others 
when they don't respond the way we desire. They don't say what we want them to say. They don't cheer when we want them to cheer. They don't cry when we want them to cry. They just don't give us what it is that we want or we believe we need at that time. And we become angry. And perhaps we hold a grudge. Perhaps we begin to think wicked thoughts about them in our minds and in our hearts. Perhaps we distance ourselves from them because we don't like that we didn't get what we needed. This is a form of control. It's a form of manipulation, emotional manipulation, especially if we make it known. If you become angry and you don't lash out at the person and you don't allow yourself to remain in that angry place, but you go before Abba and you allow him to show you these things and help you, then this is not witchcraft. It's just you demonstrating a character flaw. But if you experience something from someone, they're not giving you what you believe you need at that time. Now, I'm not talking about sinning against you. I'm just talking about responding in a way that you want, you desire at a particular time. If you don't get that and you become angry and you begin to hold a grudge and you begin to avoid that person and you begin to treat them differently, you withhold your love you withhold your gifts, you withhold your time, you withhold something from them, you hold offense against them in some way, in some small way, maybe some great way, it's witchcraft. Because they're going to feel what you're feeling and they're going to respond to it, especially if the person does sense something from you and they come to you and they say, are we okay? Is everything good? I just sense a little, a little thing happening. And you go, oh, no, everything's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. So now you're lying, right? You're not being truthful. And now there's a wedge between you and your brother or you and your sister. This is not acceptable. It's a form of emotional manipulation. And it's not honest. It lacks integrity. And it's not what Abba intends for us with regard to our relationships. And oftentimes... Wives are at the leading edge of this in relationships and marriages. Now, it doesn't mean husbands aren't to blame as well. You know, husbands play their part. I would say that husbands become angry when they don't get what they want. For example, if perhaps it's not a good time to express, you know, intimacy, they may become angry when it's just not a good time. And that's not a good thing to do because patience and love is needed in relationships at all times. And so that would not be appropriate. Or if a husband, for example, got angry at his wife because maybe the dinner didn't turn out the way that he wanted it to. In some way, it's an example of using our emotions to cause people to feel our wrath and our displeasure. And so only the Most High knows if we're doing these things. You and the Most High. And sometimes we don't even know ourselves that we're doing it. It's something that we need to submit before the Father and ask him to search our hearts. Do we have strings attached? Or are we becoming angry when other people don't respond the way we desire? I'll give an example. Wives are famous for doing this. When our husbands don't operate or don't respond in the way we want them to, when they don't do what we want, say what we want, act the way we want, we often get angry and we go silent. We become angry and we go silent. It's witchcraft. We're attempting to control our husbands through our silence. And some women, some of us, some wives, attempt to control our husbands through withholding sexual favors. It is a wife's obligation to submit in that way. And we will find ourselves when we're angry saying no, repeatedly, because we're trying to make our husbands pay for our displeasure. It's witchcraft. It's devilish. And it's wrong. It's wrong. When you're withholding either your body or your voice from your husband or your children or whomever, you are attempting to control their behavior 
by withdrawing your love from them. Abba doesn't do that. Even though he punishes us, he never withdraws his love. So we really need to search our hearts to see whether or not we're doing this. It can creep into our lives just like that. Before you know it, you're manipulating, controlling people with your emotions. You withhold your approval, and then they go seeking after it. And you make yourself to them as a god. Because they're seeking your approval and not the most highs. And so the father showed me this. And I was like, wow, that's how it works. That's how insidious it is. So wives, I caution you. Check yourselves. Don't hold your husbands to a standard that you can't live up to yourself. They're not perfect. They're never going to be. Never. The best they can do is to be conformed to Yahushua's image, same as you. Don't withhold yourself from them. Don't withhold your conversation from them when they don't do what you want them to do. Okay? It's witchcraft. Number three, offense. Offense is to feel hurt, angry, or upset by something that someone said or did to you. You're offended. I can't believe you did that. I'm offended. Offense is a trap of Hasatan. If he can get you trapped in offense, he can control your emotions and he can take you wherever he wants you to be if he gets you trapped in offense. Offense says, I know I should forgive you, but I know you hurt me and I know the father wants me to turn the other cheek, but that's offense. It's a trap and we should avoid it like we would avoid any bad thing. So to become offended when people speak their truth to you, for example, if you have an encounter with someone and they feel a certain way and you become offended, you don't hear what they have to say. You don't allow them to really speak what they have in their heart because the minute they tell you that you did something wrong, you're offended. I don't want to hear this. I'm offended. Instead of going to Abba, Yahuwah, and saying, Abba, is it true? Abba, search me, try me, show me any wickedness in me. You're offended. You say, no, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm not guilty of that, you say. And you refuse to see the truth about yourself because you want to worship yourself. You're your own G.O.D. in that moment. And you want them to worship you too by not seeing any fault in you. We all have faults. We've all failed. We have all fallen short of the glory of Ab Yahuwah, all of us. And we all have things still in ourselves, in our personalities, that need to be worked out, all of us. And someone could come to you with an aunt, and they could be right or they could be wrong. But receive them, right? Receive them. And ask yourself, is it true? And if you can't give yourself the truth, go to the Father. Go to the Father. This is what I recommend we all do. Even if it hurts your feelings, even if it makes you feel a certain kind of way, go to Abba and ask him, is it true? Because it could be true what they're saying about you. And if it is, it's an opportunity to repent and change. We all need that. We all want that. Okay? But when we get mad and offended, we cover. So we don't have to deal with our wickedness. We don't have to deal with our sinful hearts. We cover that by saying, I'm offended that you would say such a thing to me without ever going to the Father and having him show you. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, you rebellious. Yeah, you said that hateful thing. Yeah, you said that mean thing. Yeah, you did that. We don't want to hear that. We can't be that way. We can't be conformed to the image of Messiah and hold on to our blame, our guilt, our sin. We have to be quick to offer it up and repent. Quick to repent. Hallelujah. Because what we do in these situations is we make the other person the blame. It's their fault. It's your fault. I didn't do anything wrong. You're the one to blame. You're the one. And so then you attach negative thoughts, negative feelings to that person. It's witchcraft. You just curse them in your mind, maybe. Maybe you're thinking bad things about them because they said that to you. And now you're engaging in mind curses against that person. 
It's witchcraft. Abba wants us to be quick to forgive. If somebody comes to you with something, hear them out. Go to Abba. Let him be your defense. If the person is saying all manner of things about you that's not true, let Abba be your defense. But don't hate your brother. Don't hate your sister. Try as much as you can to bring peace and shalom to the situation. Be a peacemaker. Peacemakers are the sons of Yahuwah. Be a peacemaker. Be a shalom maker. Number four, manipulation. Manipulation is shrewd and devious, dishonest and sneaky behavior designed to bring others to your point of view, opinion, or to somehow otherwise control them. You want them to think the way you think, operate the way you operate, be the way you be. You want to make them over in your own image, not in the image of Messiah and not in the image of the Father, but in yours. And ultimately, those who engage in such behavior, or the behavior of manipulation, they ultimately hope to gain an advantage, a hook, or somehow a hold on another person through their action. They want to have them become part of them. They want to be able to grab them by the scruff of their necks, so to speak, and hold on, having something on them. Perhaps other people are manipulated through the need to prove themselves worthy. They need to be loved. They need to be accepted. So oftentimes, this form of manipulation is expressed in means of control. Now, sometimes there's schmoozing that takes place. Oh, I really like you. I think you're wonderful. I'm going to give you all these compliments and tell you how great you are. Sometimes that could be the case. But if it doesn't begin that way, oftentimes it ends up with this massive amount of control and some sort of physical, verbal, or emotional abuse, right? It is to be brought under the control of a person so that they can use you for their own purposes. It's manipulation. And it's so easy to enter into. It's so easy for us to slip into these things. And we don't even realize that we're doing it. And when we do... It's witchcraft. It's a desire to have what you want from a person by using cunning. Cunning, shrewdness. Maybe you say just the right thing in order to get what you want. Here's a little example. Somebody's got some tomatoes and you want some tomatoes and you see that that person has tomatoes. You could just say, may I have some tomatoes? I really been wanting some tomatoes. You could just say that. But instead you go, hmm, what lovely tomatoes. Wow, it has been ages since I've had some tomatoes. It's just amazing to me how healthy they are, what a benefit they are. Now, some people can't tolerate them, but I've always tolerated them very well. Oh, tomatoes, they've always been my favorite. Now, you all over the place, instead of just saying, can I have some tomatoes, please? You are engaging in manipulation because you know the person listening to you has no choice, really, but to stop and say, do you want some tomatoes? And then you get what you want, but you weren't direct and you weren't honest. We engage manipulation a lot more than we realize. And when we do, we are controlling others. It's witchcraft. You're getting what you want through surreptitious means. It's witchcraft. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. So this is not something we should engage in ever. And so we all need to take this before Abba and say, Abba, show me the ways in which I'm engaging in manipulation. Show me the ways in which I'm controlling others through my opinions, through my words, through my trickery, through my smooth talking. Show me, Abba, and heal me so that I do it no more. We don't want to be like the wicked one. We want to be like Abba Huah, not like the wicked one. We don't want to be manipulated. We don't want to be like Eve, Hua, who was manipulated and controlled by the hissing words of the Hasatan serpent in the garden. We don't want that. And we certainly don't want to treat others in that way. So let us all search ourselves. Let us all search ourselves. These are all ways in which we engage in witchcraft without knowing it. 
Hallelujah. And finally, rebellion. Rebellion is opposition to one in authority or dominance. It's saying, you're not going to tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. It could be a child. It could be a wife refusing to submit to the authority of her husband. It could be an employer who has an employee who will not submit. It could be refusing to submit to the laws of the land. It could be refusing to submit to the leadership currently in office because you don't like them or because you don't like their political affiliation. Rebellion. All power comes from Ab Yahuwah. He sets up kings and rulers. And if someone has power, it's because the Most High allowed them to have it. Period. So we are to honor the giver of the power, even if we can't honor the person who possesses the power. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, we read, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of Yahuwah, he has also rejected thee from being king. You want to get rejected by the Most High Yahuwah? Engage in rebellion. It was the sin of rebellion that got our ancestors punished in the wilderness. They rebelled against the authority the Father had given to Masha. Repeatedly. Who are you? We're Levites too. The Most High doesn't only talk to you, Masha. He talks to us too. We're Levites. We're all brothers and sisters, right? You don't have any power or authority over me. We're just... We're just brothers and sisters. Yes, we are. But though we are brothers and sisters, the Most High gave the mantle to one person. He gave it to Masha. And then Masha was able to share that authority with others. Still, chosen. We are far too familiar with one another. We are far too familiar with the Most High. We are far too familiar with His Son, Yahusha. We have to understand that we live in an absolute monarchy. That is our kingdom. That is our kingdom. And we must treat the leadership with ultimate respect. Ultimate respect. Number one, all respect and honor and hab to the Most High Yahuwah. And secondly, to his son, Yahusha Hamashiach. And thirdly, to those whom Yahusha has given authority to teach, to preach, to evangelize, to witness, to encourage, to shepherd his people. If you don't honor the Most High, his son, or those whom he has chosen to lead, to shepherd, who are elders in the faith, deacons in the faith, deaconesses in the faith, you dishonor the Most High Yahuwah ultimately because all power comes from him. So all rebellion, really at the heart of it, is rebelling against Ab Yahuwah. So we obey because ultimately we want to obey Ab Yahuwah, right? You rebelling, wife, against your husband, you're rebelling against Yahuwah. You children, rebelling against your parents, ultimately you're rebelling against the Most High Yahuwah. You rebelling against your more, your Mora, your teacher, you're rebelling against the Most High Yahuwah. Because if the Father called that person, then they have been given authority. And if they have been given authority, it is to be respected. Now, if you don't believe that person has been given any authority, then you shouldn't be sitting under their teaching. Period. Go and find the person that you believe the Father has set you under, and then submit to that authority, under the authority, of course, of Yahushua Mashiach, ultimately, and the Father over him. But rebellion Rebelling against the Most High's will, rebelling against what the Father tells us to do, rebelling against his leaders, it's sin, it's witchcraft. There are times when we are want to disagree with things that we hear. Maybe someone has made a decision about something and we think, I don't think they're right. I don't think their decision is right. I don't think they should have done that. I know they're the leader, but I just don't agree with that decision. Keep your opinion to yourself. I'm, I'm telling you. Keep that opinion to yourself or take it to Abba. Say, Abba, this person made this decision. I didn't like that decision. And let Abba deal with you. If the person made a mistake, Abba will deal with that person. 
Because if you put your mouth on the most high's anointed, now you're going to have to deal with Abba. Because he defends that person. He corrects that person. Stubbornness, hard-heartedness are also forms of rebellion. Not doing what you're told. You know what to do. You're like, nah, I'm not doing that. I'm not listening to her. I'm not listening to him. Rebellion, stubbornness, hard-heartedness, witchcraft. All of it. You may say, how? How is that witchcraft? Because it's designed to control another person. You're looking to control the trajectory of your life and your experience with that person through your emotional reaction. Somehow, maybe you think that if you get angry, if you walk off in a huff, or if you put your hands on your hips and you shrug your shoulders and you say, I don't like that decision that you made, that the person's going to change their minds just for you. It's witchcraft. It's not how we operate. If we have a problem with anything, we take it to Abba and say, Abba, please grant me favor in this situation. Please grant me favor. And let Abba take care of the situation. It should never be our goal and objective to have our will be done all the time. We are not the be-all and end-all of anything because our hearts are desperately wicked and we can't even know the degree to which it is wicked. So how is it that we could want our will to be done all the time? We should want Abba's will to be done, period. So when we rebel against the Most High's authority sent to us, we're getting ourselves in big trouble. So may we surrender, especially as we practice now for going home. The Father is even now setting up an authority structure through his Son. And we need to learn how to obey. We need to learn how to submit. We need to learn how to surrender. If you have to grin and bear it, grin and bear it. Do whatever you have to do to submit. When we rebel, we are seeking to have our own will be done above Ab Yahuwah's will. I know you may not see it that way but I want you to really think about it. When a person who's rebelling just wants what they want, they're not thinking about what Abba's will is. They're only thinking about their own. And in that moment, that's all they want, their own will. So we all have to check ourselves. We all do. We all do. The Father speaks his will through his word. He speaks his will through his Son. And his Son expresses the will of the Father through the servants that he's chosen. And if those servants are not faithful, if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, they're going to get themselves in trouble. The Father will judge. The Father will correct. First, he will correct before he brings judgment. All praises for that. Thank the Father that he corrects before he just brings the hammer down. He's so good to us. I also want to speak to this subtlety of rebellion. Rebellion doesn't always have to be outward pumping your fists, saying, I don't like what you just did. I don't like you. Change your mind. Rebellion can be subtle. It could be you just sitting back, not saying anything, but just in your mind and in your heart saying, I don't agree with that decision. I shouldn't have done that. Oh boy, I don't like this. And you're not saying a word. You've got a smile on your face. You're acting all agreeable, but in your heart, you're saying, no, I don't think that's right. Abba sees that. Abba sees it whether you scream and yell at the top of your lungs or whether you whisper quietly. Abba sees it all. So we all have to check ourselves, all of us. Because if you hold feelings of ill will against a leader or against a brother or sister, Abba sees it. He knows it. And then eventually that ill will will begin to fester into bitterness, and that bitterness will morph into hatred, and you will find yourself hating your brother and your sister. And how can you hate your brother or sister who you see, and yet say you love the Most High, whom you have never seen? To hate is the same as murder. So we have to be careful to submit ourselves to the Most High through the leadership that He gives us, and not be rebellious. We are all, like I said earlier, to let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. Any more than this leads us into evil. We've got to be under somebody's control. If we try to rule our own lives, we can lead ourselves into a ditch. 
The Father has given us leaders for the purpose of helping us to arrive at our destination. It doesn't mean those leaders are perfect, because nobody is, save the Father and Yahusha in Him. But we're all striving to be made perfect, and as we strive together, the Father has given us, through Yahusha, the fivefold ministry, apostles and prophets and teachers and preachers and evangelists, for the perfecting of the saints, for the building up of the body of Mashiach, till we all, till we all come to the full unity of the faith and the full stature of Mashiach. We're all striving to get there. And while we're working to get there, let us submit as we are called to submit. We are first called to submit one to another. Wives are called to submit to their husbands. We're called to submit to governments and authorities. We're also called to submit to Yahusha and ultimately the Father. But in that, we are also called to submit to those leaders that have been placed over us without murmuring and without complaining. These things are pleasing to the Most High. So we have been talking today about ways in which we, even in the awakening, even seeking after the Most High's heart, have been engaging in witchcraft. To seek to control another in any way, whether through flattery, kind words, giving of gifts, getting angry at them, yelling at them, or even schmoozing, whatever it is you're doing, resisting the authority that's been placed over you, all forms and ways and means of control, controlling another person's behavior, it's witchcraft. It's trying to get what you want, separate and apart from the Most High Yahuwah. And I'm thankful to the Father for revealing the ways that we have been doing and engaging these activities without even realizing it. And now that we know, we need to submit ourselves unto Abba for his examination. And we need to ask him to show us all the ways in which we are rebelling, being offended, in which we are manipulating, in which we are becoming angry when people tell us the truth, and also the ways in which we are giving with strings attached. Make sure your motives are pure. We all need to do it. And as I speak to you right now, I'm thinking to myself, oh, Abba, I need to ask you to search me. I want to make sure that my motives are pure before you and before others. I thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining me today for this lesson. It is a much needed word within the whole nation of Yasharal. It's a much needed word. And I'm thankful to the Most High for bringing it up. He brought it up as a result of a dream that I had. And then he brought the revelation based on that dream. So I am so thankful to the Father for bringing this up, and putting this on our radar, so to speak, so that we can check ourselves. We need to check ourselves, all of us. So I just pray, Abba, that you would help us to be conformed to the image of Yahusha, that you would cause us to be plain in our speak, humble and teachable, and not easily offended. Help us to be able to receive truth when people speak truth and not get offended and not get on our high horse. And even if we're wronged, help us to do it and receive it with grace and come to you to be our defense and our defender. Father, break the shackles of witchcraft off of us. Break off of us and away from us all of these superstitions that we have believed and adopted and allowed to become a part of our belief system. Father, set us free, I pray. Set us free. Whom Yahuwah sets free is free indeed. Thank you for the truth that you sent to us through Yahusha. He is the grace and the truth that you sent. Thank you, Abba. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for setting us free. And may witchcraft and divination and sorcery and soothsaying and superstition not be named among us. May it be far away from us. 
May we completely and totally, Father, submit ourselves unto you so that you can bring into our lives what you want us to have. We don't have to manipulate and control in order to get it. You bring what you desire for us to have, Father. Cause us to trust in you. Cause us to trust. Hallelujah. Aman and aman. Well, I thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining me once again for another teaching, for another lesson. And I pray that this one really touches your heart. I pray that you immediately after this lesson will get into Abba's presence and say, show me myself. Show me. Show me all the ways in which I have adopted superstitions. Show me all the ways in which I am engaging in witchcraft. I am trying to control others through my either adding something to their lives with strings attached, giving excessive compliments, or being offended, manipulating, or rebelling. Show me all the ways in which I am sinning, Father. So this should be our prayer before him. And I pray that you'll do it. It's necessary. Abba's getting us clean. He's getting us clean because the end is near. And when Yahushua returns to judge, he will judge all of the wicked, Hebrew and Gentile. So may we have clean garments before him and be ready to receive him as our king. Baruch haba basham, Yahuwah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahuwah. Hushiana, Hushiana in the highest, Hushiana. May the Most High Yahuwah Baruch and keep you, brothers and sisters, bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom, shalom, peace in every area of life. And may we truly check ourselves to see whether we're in the faith, to see whether our ways are pleasing to the Most High. May we daily submit ourselves to his examination. May he search us and try us and show us all the wickedness that be in us. Until we all come to the point in which Yahushua has been fully formed in us and we shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father, perfected, ready to rule and reign with our King, our Master, Yahushua. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for this teaching. Thank you for your goodness to us. Shalom and shalom, brothers and sisters. Shalom and shalom.